And I'm a registered nurse here at the um, Buda Medical Center, and I work in the uh, Regional Heart Center in the Echo Lab. Um, so this is my little family here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm also a, a, a holistic um, health and nutrition coach too, and I specialize in working with people with chronic autoimmune disease to kind of identify their main health triggers um, and work on reducing stress and working on diet and lifestyle changes and everything like that in order to kind of live a more vibrant life, not totally burdened by chronic disease and autoimmune disease. Um, and so that's what I'm going to share with you today. I do work with people in a lot of other capacities, just like nutrition-wise, who want to eat healthier, have digestive issues, all of these things. Um, but my main focus is autoimmune disease, and it's partly informed by my own experience with autoimmune disease, so I'll speak a little bit about that today as well. Um, but today, I will present to you living well with autoimmune disease. Um, and before we start, I'm just going to have everyone do a little um, relaxation breathing. And uh, it's probably for me and for you, but <laughs> it'll make more sense why later um, this is important. And I promise I won't make you do anything interactive after this. So, um, if you can just put your hands on your belly like this, and what you're going to do is oftentimes we start breathing, or we breathe throughout the day, and we're really up here in our chest, and we don't even realize it. And so I want you to focus on just kind of breathing into your stomach and letting your hands go out in and out as you breathe. But what we're going to do is something called five, seven, eight breathing. And it's a really good little breathing technique. Some of you probably do it or have heard of it. Um, but it's really easy and something I do with a lot of people too. Um, and so what you do is you breathe in through your nose for a count of five in your belly and you feel your belly expand. And then you hold it for a count of seven. Not like you're going to explode, just kind of like gently hold it. And then you exhale through your nose for a count of eight slowly. Um, and then you do it again. So we'll do one together. So we'll inhale for a count of five, and then hold it for a count of seven, and then slowly exhale through your nose for a count of eight. And so we're just going to do four more of those, that's it. Um, and so I'll do one together with you and then we'll do one on your own time. And you can totally close your eyes and just relax and chill out for a second, so that's the point. So we'll breathe in for five and hold for seven, and exhale for eight, and then we'll just do three more on our own. big range of people. Um, I know there's some rheumatologists in the audience who know a lot about autoimmune disease and some people who came maybe feeling like you might have some symptoms or joint pain or aches or pain something or you may have a diagnosed autoimmune disease so you know a bit about it um, or people that are related to me by blood and were forced to come or <laughs> like there's a whole range so I'm just gonna do a kind of a big overview um, and there'll be something for everyone, even if you don't yourself suffer from an autoimmune disease or a chronic disease, it's just kind of, um, there's some good tips on how to be healthy and happy that we can all take away. So, um, so what is autoimmune disease? Um, so really simply, it's just when your immune system attacks your own tissue that it's viewing as foreign for one reason or another. Um, there are over 80 types of autoimmune conditions and it's a huge spectrum. So it goes from um, a huge range. It goes from even just having blood work that tells you how antibodies that your immune system might be um, in overdrive or attacking certain tissues to um, feeling vague symptoms of fatigue or brain fog or achy joints, things like that, 
to then having you know something that's an organ specific disease um, so say these you know your immune system is attacking your thyroid you would be diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis if it's attacking your pancreas you would be diagnosed with type 1 um, diabetes um, so what this chart is showing here is there are organ specific autoimmune diseases and then there are non organ specific or systemic autoimmune diseases that affect um, you know your whole body so that's things like if your immune system was attacking your joints at a more systemic level you would have rheumatoid arthritis um, and if it's more widespread something like lupus as well so it's just this huge range um, and like I said there's about 80 different types that have been identified yet today um, so I want to talk about inflammation because I'll be kind of referring to that throughout this and inflammation is um, the first response of our immune system so um, you know we learned in nursing school like when you get a cut um, inflammation occurs and you get pain redness swelling um, and heat are the four signs of inflammation and um, we want that to happen because it means that our body is sending um, is sending cells and nourishment to help heal that cut on our hand um, but what happens when you have chronic low-grade inflammation is your body is constantly putting out this inflammatory response to something like stress or food sensitivities um, different things like that and that's when it becomes a problem and can develop into symptoms so um, although you may not really fit into one of these disease categories you could be experiencing symptoms of system-wide inflammation from this chronic low-grade inflammation um, and that would put you on the autoimmune spectrum as well um, so that that this just gives you an idea of kind of the burden of autoimmune disease in the community so you kind of have an idea um, it, the ARDA estimates that it affects over 50 million Americans um, and cancer affects up to 9 million heart disease up to 22 million so it's a huge um, burden on our population and there's a good chance that you or someone you know is affected by autoimmune disease um, and I just thought it was important to note that women make up about 75% of this population so um, gender is a definite risk factor for having an, an autoimmune disease as well this is just another slide kind of showing what I was talking about um, how it's pretty divided oh, this says there's over 100 autoimmune disease maybe there's over 100 um, but you know if it affects uh, your skin you might get psoriasis or vitiligo um, if your GI tract celiac or Crohn's disease something like that also this is important because it kind of shows um, how it's a little bit disjointed like there's no real such thing as an autoimmune doctor I guess there's you know rheumatologists or different types of doctors but um, you know if you have a thyroid problem you're seeing an endocrinologist if you have a skin problem you're going to a dermatologist GI tract you're going to GI doc so it's a little bit disjointed in that way and sometimes can be difficult um, for people wanting to get sort of holistic care you know like if you have a heart problem you go to a cardiologist they know everything about it and, and that's what you do but this is a little bit trickier and can sometimes lead to longer diagnosis um, which I'll talk about a little bit later too which is one of the issues of autoimmune disease as well so yeah it's just another idea for you um, so what causes autoimmune disease is threefold um, so genetics environment diet and lifestyle um, so genetics play a definite role in autoimmunity um, what's interesting though is we actually inherit groups of um, uh, genes that um, predispose us to having autoimmune conditions so that's why you might see in families people with um, you know diabetes and lupus and uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis or things like that not necessarily all getting the exact same disease um, and uh, just this here to illustrate it um, celiac disease that affects the lining of the gut um, its incidence is one in a hundred people in the general population and if you've got a family member with it it's one in 22 so there's a definite genetic component to autoimmunity but that being said it does not doom you to live a life you know completely burdened by your autoimmune disease um, environment diet and lifestyle play a huge role in not only the development but sort of the progression of autoimmune disease too and um, when I work with people I'm working in these two areas obviously I can't change your genetics so I'm working in environment and diet and lifestyle mostly um, and like what I said in environment 
genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. It's like a rather violent analogy, but like what I mean is just sort of the environment is the thing that's gonna, like many diseases, trigger you to then develop the disease. Um, and by environment, I mean, um, I mean like bacteria or viruses. You often hear of getting like um, Epstein-Barr virus and that triggering an autoimmune condition. Um, so things like that. Also pollutants, chemicals you're exposed to in the workplace. Um, even pesticides, things on your food can be environmental irritants that can, in certain people who are predisposed, trigger an autoimmune disease. Um, and then diet and lifestyle. I guess like I mostly work on diet and lifestyle with people. Um, but the two main things there are intestinal permeability. I don't know if you've all heard of that or leaky gut is what it's called, um, which is like the grosser sounding name, but this is like the more formal one. Um, and it basically is, I'm gonna talk about it a lot more later, so I'll just give you a little idea. Um, but it's just to do with the health of your digestive system and your, um, and your gut and how that affects the development of inflammation and autoimmune disease. Um, and then stress, stress is huge and definitely underestimated. Um, in how much it contributes to autoimmune disease. So those are things that we can modify and things that we can change and things that I mostly work with people on too and what I'm gonna to talk to you a lot more about um, in this talk. So the current treatment um, for autoimmune disease, um, the first thing is diagnosis. And I kind of touched on that before. Um, the Those that are, like people that are with autoimmune disease that are looking for a diagnosis typically do so for four years, and that's a really long time. Um, and the reason for that is, like I said before, there's really, sometimes it's just that there's really vague symptoms. So you go to the doctor and you're like, I just don't feel good. I feel tired, I have a headache, I have brain fog, and my joints kind of hurt sometimes, and they're like, oh, well, you're just getting older, or it's in your head, or things like that. So it can be really vague, the onset of autoimmune symptoms, and it makes it really difficult to diagnose. Um, another reason is, you know, if you're going from doctor to doctor, um, you may not get sort of that continuity of care. Um, and so it can be a little bit, you know, can add to sort of the time to diagnosis. And that's one of the most difficult things um, with people with autoimmune disease. And um, actually I have a friend who started a company here in Seattle called Gray Zone, and they basically work just on this to kind of address that issue of diagnosis of autoimmune disease um, and kind of close that. Gray zone, G-R-E-Y, zone, yeah. It's a, a relatively new company, but she's been working with practitioners for a while, but really cool, and they, um, yeah, and they work specifically to address this issue um, and kind of bring together care teams and try and shorten the time to diagnosis, because diagnosis <coughs> isn't everything, um, but it gives you, sometimes can give you peace of mind, like what you're feeling is real, um, it can also give you a treatment plan, um, which is important, um, and it kind of gives you, so, yeah, sort of a path forward. Um, but it's not, you know, a, it's, diagnosis can be the beginning, but it's, it is important to get some sort of diagnosis. Um, so that's the first step. And then the second step is um, the treatment. And really, I guess there's no, like, cure for autoimmune disease right now. Um, there are, the mainstays for treating it are um, basically managing the symptoms. Um, so if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have a lot of pain in your joints, um, you would be managing your that pain by doing physical therapy or taking painkillers or things like that. Um, and also working to suppress the inflammation. So your immune system is on overdrive. And what we're trying to do then with this, the treatment that happens now is to suppress that. Um, and so there's different drugs that I have down here that are kind of work to, to, to do that. Um, so the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, there's the corticosteroids like prednisone, um, the DMARDs, I think methotrexate, um, and then biologic drugs. So you've probably seen commercials for like Enbrel, Humira, things like that. Um, so those work to essentially turn off parts of your immune system. Um, so we're just, we're suppressing the inflammation and then we're managing the symptoms depending on what you've got. Hormone replacement is like if you have type 1 diabetes, you're going to be getting insulin. Um, if you have thyroid, low thyroid, you're going to be getting thyroid hormone replacement. So that's kind of what's going on right now. And 
these conventional treatments are amazing, and I probably wouldn't be standing here if it weren't for most of those interventions. Um, so I think they definitely have a great place um, and are really necessary at certain points in people's treatment, for sure. But that being said, there's, there's more. And oftentimes it kind of just stops right here um, in terms of how we conventionally treat autoimmune disease. And, um, and so I want to take it a little bit further than this. Um, but, but that being said, these are great for certain, um, certain times, I think, um, and certain people's cases. So um, this is from the Institute of Functional Medicine. And functional medicine is a branch of medicine. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's kind of, it, you know, regular practitioners can get trained to be functional medicine um, doctors or providers. And they sort of work to um, get at the root cause of disease. So the focus is getting at the root cause. You can see up here, this is kind of where we work usually right now, you know, cardiology, endocrinology, GI, all this stuff. Um, basically, all I want you to know is um, down here at the roots. So at the roots, it has um, sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, uh, nutrition, hydration, stress and resilience, relationships and networks, trauma, microorganisms, which I think is referring to like the gut microorganisms, um, and environmental pollutants. So these are the things down at the roots that um, are really important and oftentimes don't get looked at at all when we're treating. We kind of treat up here a lot of the time. And one of my favorite uh, sayings or ideas about this is if you have a tree and you look at it and its leaves are yellow, you don't just go and paint the leaves green. You go down to the roots and you see what's going on. Why are they yellow? Um, and a lot of times what treat other treatments kind of stop at is painting the leaves green and we're okay. Um, but there's a lot of different things down here and this is what I work with clients on too while they're still being getting these other treatments um, to see if there's more we can do um, in that way in terms of nutrition and exercise and, like I said, stress and even relationships. I mean, you wouldn't think of that, but your relationships would have anything to do with autoimmune disease or how you feel, um, but they do. They definitely do. And this is another one I like um, from Sydney Baker, who's a functional uh, <laughs> doctor. So if you're sitting on a tack, the solution is to find and remove the tack, not treat the pain. So same, same idea, same idea, but I like it. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my autoimmune story um, before I tell you kind of about what I learned and what you can do. Um, so you have an idea. But I was diagnosed with adult onset Stills disease. It's a very weird, rare autoimmune disease um, when I was 18. And um, it was first diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis and then later progressed to this Stills disease. Um, cardiac and people might know it because it sometimes has cardiac involvement, but thankfully I don't. Um, and so I was previously very healthy, 18-year-old um, in high school, running tons, playing tennis and sports and everything. And then I started to get these really weird, vague flu-like symptoms. Um, and it was these shaking chills and really high spiking fevers and just these drenching sweats that would kind of come um, in like a circadian rhythm, sort of. Like, so it would come at night and then by the morning I'd be okay. And then it would just happen over and over. So I thought I had a really bad flu. Um, and it just kept progressing, getting worse and worse and worse. I thought I would just rest and it would be fine. Kept getting worse. Um, and then it was really, really bad. And one night I had a horrible pain in my back and couldn't breathe. And um, I re actually remember I ended up calling my parents down the hall saying something's really wrong, I can't, I can't breathe. And was taken to the closest hospital, which was Children's at the time, um, and then was found to have a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot that goes from your leg up to your lung, um, which is a little bit of a wild card in the whole picture of the autoimmune thing, but this part of it. Um, and then still these really vague flu-like symptoms. Um, so then when I'm in hospital, they're like, okay, does she have dengue fever? Does she have, you know, West Nile virus, all these different things. And I'm like, I live in Northeast Seattle. I really don't think so, but maybe, I don't know. Um, and so I was kind of tested for all that stuff. And then we're so lucky in Seattle to have such great hospitals and healthcare and you know all of that. So I was lucky to be diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, rheumatoid, even though not, not the right one, but that's okay, um, uh, pretty early. Um, and then 
left the hospital as quick as I could so I could walk in my high school graduation. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was lucky that I was able to be diagnosed with something so quick and they put me really quickly on high dose steroids, the prednisone, if any of you have been on that, you know, it's horrible. Um, and um, was started on a sort of regime of different drugs to try and figure it out. And essentially it was suppressing my symptoms, suppressing my fevers, and that worked um, to suppress the fevers, but I felt horrible all the time still. Um, and there wasn't really a clear idea or any investigation of like why this happened at all. Um, I had no idea. I was totally healthy, no idea. So um, probably much to um, my parents' dismay, I still decided I wanted to go down to college in LA like I had planned, um, even though I was really sick. And so I was just really sick through that whole first year of college on all these crazy meds, trying to figure everything out. Um, and I would have breakthrough fevers. Um, basically what it is is just these really bad fevers um, and some stiffness and things like that. Um, and yeah, no real, just sort of a sense that I had to be on these really high dose steroids and medications that were making me feel awful for the rest of my life was kind of the idea. Um, Cause there was really nothing, there was no other, nothing else being proposed to me. Um, and so one sort of turning point for me was um, I went to, I was back in Seattle for a break and I went to my rheumatologist um, who was great and I was seeing his nurse practitioner. And so I told her my whole story, she was new to me. I told her my whole story like I told five million doctors over the last year and a half or so. Um, I was kind of expected her to say, okay, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing, you know, we'll see. And she just kind of stopped and she looked at me and she said, wow, you've gone through a lot. How are you doing with all of this? Um, and that completely floored me because that was honestly the first time that any practitioner or doctor, anyone had asked me how I was doing and what I thought about all of this that had happened to me. It, it sounds insane, but I, I assure you, <laughs> it was. And I was just so taken aback. I was like, what do you mean, how am I doing? I'm doing what you told me to do, so I'm doing everything, you know, whatever. Um, and I told her, I said, I feel horrible on these medications. It's like, I was on a medication where you couldn't drink any alcohol as a freshman in college. It was awful. <laughs> so I'm horrible. Um, and. I just, I was still having breakthroughs in my fevers. It wasn't curing anything, nothing was happening. So she said, okay, well, why don't we try something new? Why don't we switch something around? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? And she basically talked to me as if I was a, a person who had a choice and a say in this rather than just this really complicated diagnosis that they were like just happy to you know, keep at bay. And um, yeah, it was really refreshing and amazing and that to me was a huge turning point. And she kind of opened my eyes to the idea that I had some control and I had some say in this um, because before it didn't feel like it was any of my business. Um, and she, yeah, she gave me that sort of permission um, to kind of look into how did my diet and lifestyle affect it? What were the triggers that were, you know, causing this to happen? What were the things that, that caused this to happen in the first place? Um, and so actually because of her, I went to nursing school and became a nurse um, because I wanted to do that for other people. Um, and so I've since told her that, so I've emailed her, so she knows. Um, but um, yeah, so from there I started, I kind of just like took that and ran. And I was like, I have control, I can do something about this. I don't have to just sit here and do what you tell me, great. So I um, started getting into diet as as an 18 year old and not to lose weight at all, but like weird anti-inflammatory diets, all the things. And you may have heard of um, Kathy Abaskal lives in Vashon. I got really into her book, um, To Quiet Inflammation. That was my first sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, foray into that whole world. Um, and then from there kind of thought, okay, what are my triggers? You know, got really into yoga, realized that running was horrible for me, made me feel really bad. And um, yeah, sort of through that, have learned a ton the past, 10 plus years, uh, it's like 12 years um, since then, and um, you know, have now become a health and nutrition coach specializing in this area because there's such a huge gap between you know, all of the treatments we have and all of the things that we do have in our control and the things that we can do. So anyway, I will stop talking about myself, but I'll tell you what I learned um, from that. So diet and autoimmune disease um, is 
is huge. Uh, you may have heard of an anti-inflammatory diet, autoimmune protocol, or gluten-free diet for autoimmunity, things like that. Um, and those are all awesome and great and yeah, wonderful. I, I don't, there's not necessarily one that works best for anyone with an autoimmune condition. It's so individual and what might be anti-inflammatory for me might be poison for you. Not, you know, like not that dramatic, but sorta. Um, and so what it is is, and what I work with people on a lot is just kind of going through and figuring out um, underlying food sensitivities if those exist and just working on removing processed food that isn't you know real food that's not really nourishing our body and putting in good healthy food and so it really is that simple um, but you know these sort of diets are a really great guide for a, a lot of people and, but they're kind of general ideas of um, what's good and what's not and basically it's just eating real whole food so real food being not processed food that's actually you know made up of nutrients that's from the earth um, and is real whole food um, and whole food meaning that it's not been it's the same thing kind of not processed a ton as well so it really really is that simple I know it can get so confusing and we think we have to be geniuses now it seems to figure out what to eat to be better um, and definitely in the case of autoimmune disease there are things we can do for periods of time they're kind of healing protocols like healing diets so that's a little bit trickier and, and good to work with someone to figure that out. Um, but I think we can all agree whether or not we believe in, you know, that anti-inflammatory diets cure everything or whatever, um, that we are what we eat. And I think we can agree that food affects us, that food doesn't just pass through us, that it goes in us and it affects our cells and our biochemistry. I think, you know, I think that's pretty universal. Um, now, you know, we, if we eat like a fried Snickers or whatever, we'll feel way worse than if we eat like a, you know, salmon, broccoli dinner. We just know this innately. Um, sometimes we get confused, but what we, we, <laughs> and, we know. Um, and then, and so it, even to take it further than we are what we eat is we are what we digest, assimilate, and absorb. And why I say that is because we each digest, assimilate, and absorb things differently and we're all so unique um, depends on what medications we take what you know what the flora is like in our guts um, our genetic makeup our heritage things like that so everyone is is so different and that's why it is important to kind of tailor it to yourself but that being said I'll give you like some I have some recipes and things for you too so um, some really easy recipes um, and easy kind of guidelines but just stick to the real whole food and you'll be just totally fine Oh, and gut health. I'm going to talk about that in now. <laughs> um, so when I talk about the gut, I mean the stomach and the small intestine and the large intestine. Our whole digestive system goes from our mouth all the way down. Um, but our gut is just stomach, small intestine, large intestine. And there's so much research out there right now about the gut microbiome. Um, so basically when I say microbiome, I mean the, um, the ecosystem in our gut, um, in our stomach, large, small intestine, large intestine. And there was a thing, the microbiome project, or microbiome, I can't remember, I can't remember what it's called right now, but um, they studied all of this and now they're extrapolating all this information from it and it's really quite interesting, or I think it is, um, about um, how it affects our bodies. So basically, even if you don't have digestive issues, like you know constipation, diarrhea, all that, um, you still have to think about your, your gut health and your stomach health because it really affects the rest of your body um, on a really deep basic level. <coughs> so there, like I said, it's the, it's the ecosystem in your, in your stomach. And so there's 500 species and three pounds of bacteria in your gut and you're like, that's gross, get it out. But you want it in there. Um, there are trillions of bacteria in there. They contain at least 100 times as many genes as you do. So it's a whole world, and it's basically like a rainforest. You can people call like a, you know make it an analogy to a rainforest. Um, that you know if you take one thing out of the rainforest, the whole thing is affected. So you want this balance um, between the the good and bad bacteria in your gut. And you know you have a dose of antibiotics, and you can feel it. Like you either get diarrhea or you get yeast infection or whatever like I can say these things because I'm a nurse so it's fine um, <laughs> but you know that it affects your stomach um, and so the composition of organisms living in your gut it not only affects your digestion but it determines um, 
how your body stores the food you eat. So they help digest things, and it really does determine if you store things as fat or muscle or you know whatever, um, how easy or hard it is for you to lose weight. So there's a lot of research, research showing that people with um, you know bad um, an imbalance in the bacteria in their gut have a, a lot of hard, harder time losing losing weight, um, and also how well your metabolism functions. So it's huge. It, it's really yeah, it's a big thing. Um, and then. 70% of our immune system is in our gut. That's, that's a really big deal. So autoimmunity, how can it not have anything to do with the gut? 70% of the immune system is in our gut because our gut and our digestive system is the most intimate contact we have with the external world. When you think about it, we're putting things in our body from the outside. So we need um, bacteria and protection in our gut to fend off foreign invaders and pathogens and bacteria so we don't get sick every time we eat. Um, so, yeah, so it's huge in, um, if your gut's out of balance and the bacteria load in your gut is out of balance, that can affect your <coughs> immune system. And it does so, um, when I was talking about the intestinal permeability or leaky gut, it does so in that way. Um, so I think that's, oh yeah, that's what I'll talk about. So, um, so yeah, this leaky gut, and I'll try and ex explain it um, in a nice, easy way. It, um, so if we can think of our, our stomach and our small intestine, um, when you flatten out your small intestine, it's the size of a tennis court. So it's so much surface area because it needs to absorb so much of the nutrients we put in our body. And um, there's like a, if you think of it as like a mesh sort of netting that lets things out in and out. So it's like a permeable barrier that lets things in and out. And so they're really small holes. And in leaky gut, um, what happens is those holes get bigger. They, they get kind of punctured and they get wider because this is um, irritated or inflamed. Uh, reasons why it might be inflamed is um, stress, high stress can inflame your gut. Um, a lot of uh, really processed food can irritate your gut. Um, food sensitivities, like if you have a really bad food sensitivity to dairy but you're kind of eating a lot of it, that can irritate the gut lead to like, um, medications, uh, antibiotics. So pretty much like everything we do all the time um, can, can lead to that. Not, it's not gonna lead to that in everyone, but it, those are kind of some causes of it. Um, and there's a lot of research being found that some people even say if you have an autoimmune disease, it's 90% or something that you have leaky gut or intestinal permeability or some sort of um, you know, irritation in the lining of your gut. So what happens is when these holes get bigger, bigger particles get out. And so bigger particles are in our bloodstream, and then our body sees them as foreign invaders because they're too big, they're not supposed to be there. So it's thing, bigger things like protein and gluten, and that's where that low-grade inflammation comes in, where the body kind of starts to react to those bigger, um, those bigger proteins that come out where they're not supposed to. So the ways to deal with this um, are to first maybe identify that you, it may be an issue for you, um, and then there's the four R's, which like any dietitian and nutritionist usually go through this sort of framework. It's remove, replace, re-inoculate, and repair. So by remove, it's basically removing foods or irritating substances, I guess stress, but we'll kind of focus on foods. So you would remove the most common ones, which we, yeah, so the most common irritating foods are gluten, dairy, refined sugar, processed foods, uh, soy and peanuts for some, um, and sometimes corn. But this is just kind of a general list. Um, it's not necessarily for everyone, but when you're doing something like this to try and figure out what might be the most irritating, these are the most common ones. Um, so you would remove those foods. Um, and it's basically you're just giving your stomach a break. Um, from this sort of low-grade inflammation. And you're eating things like vegetables, whole foods, whole grains, you know, rice um, is you know, possible to, um, meats if you eat meats, eggs, things like that, just sort of whole foods, steering away from those foods I mentioned. Um, and then replace, it's basically is like replacing what you're deficient in. So if you are having really slow, sluggish digestion, and that's kind of what's um, contributing to this leaky gut, you may need some stomach acid supplements or some digestive enzymes or things like that. I don't really have, to, that could be like a whole nother thing, so I might just leave it at that. Um, but you would replace with certain things. 
re-inoculate is putting back in the good bacteria. Uh, one of the main causes of leaky gut is an imbalance in that good and bad bacteria. So you could have had a you know really strong dose of antibiotics for a while, and your your good bacteria is just shot. It's just wiped them out. Um, and so you'd re-inoculate, meaning you need to put in that good bacteria with probiotics or probiotic foods, which probiotic foods are um, fermented foods like sauerkraut or kimchi, um, kefir, like certain types of yogurt. It's not like really, really sugary ones, but um, certain types of yogurts, things like that. Um, and then the last step is repair. And so it's just repairing the lining of the gut. So removing those foods that are irritating can do a lot of work to repair. Um, but you um, may want to do things like, you probably heard of bone broth, it's like very hot right now. You can drink bone broth, that does, you know, the collagen in that works to soothe the lining of the gut. You could see a naturopath or a dietitian. they could uh, give you some ideas about supplements to take, like slippery elm or aloe or things like that that help soothe the gut. Um, so that's kind of the last stage. So those are kind of the main, um, the main things or the main protocol you do for that leaky gut. And then, so yeah, we went over the foods to avoid. So the foods that you want to eat. So the first one I put up there are good fats. And everybody is so scared of fats, you know, because fat makes you fat, but it really doesn't. Um, sugar and stuff makes you fat. But fat um, is necessary, and you need good fats like um, avocados, nuts, coconut, coconut oil, um, things like that to help sort of lubricate your whole system. Good fats are essential. And a lot of times people are kind of deprived of them because we have this mentality that fats are really bad, bad for you. So, um, and then like I said, probiotic foods and then fruits and vegetables. So yeah, you just get all your nutrients um, from fruits and vegetables. So eat a rainbow of that and try and get as many different kinds as you can. Um, and those are kind of the things you'd be adding in. Of course you can eat other foods, but these are the ones that we would be mindfully putting into the diet to help. Um, and then, so a kind of a second pillar in addition to diet um, is stress. And so like I talked about, it's huge. Um, oftentimes we're hanging out in the sympathetic nervous system. So we have our sympathetic fight and flight response. But our body these days doesn't know the difference between um, like if you're in the jungle and the lion's chasing you versus like preparing for a talk that you have to give in front of people. <laughs> um, you know, so you get all stressed out. Um, and then the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. So that's where we want to be. Your body can't digest and rest and heal in the sympathetic. And we're all so busy and we have so much going on and we're like flooded with information and all of these things all the time that we're, we really hang out in the sympathetic a lot. Um, and that affects our stress hormones, so produces cortisol and things like that that can affect our immune system function. Um, so what we want to do, and why I had you do the breathing, was to activate the relaxation response, activate the parasympathetic <coughs> nervous system. Um, so things like that diaphragmatic breathing directly activates your parasympathetic it's by having your diaphragm move like that. It activates that so you can get yourself into the parasympathetic and activate the relaxation response. And if we give our bodies half a chance, they will do a lot of healing on their own. We just need to get them into that relaxation mode. And I know it's like, if one more person tells you to take a bubble bath, you'll punch them in the face. Like, it's not that easy, but it's like you just need to focus on something that works for you. So it could be the breathing, it could be yoga, it could be meditation, it could be all of the above. Um, but it's really important, especially with chronic disease and healing um, and everything. And I, this is a quote from um, Lisa Rinkin. She's a doctor that wrote this book called Mind Over Medicine. And so she says, with all those negative emotions filling her mind and all those stress hormones coursing through her body, no vegetable, supplement, exercise program, or drug was going to be strong enough to counteract the harmful health effects of chronic stress response on her body. So basically, I could tell you to eat all the kale and broccoli in the world, and if you're super stressed all the time at work, or you're in an abusive relationship, or you're you know just really really heightened sense of stress, it does it's not going to matter um, because your body's not going to be able to really heal, um, you know, in the best way. So that's why I work with my clients a lot too on you know stress and sleep 
because um, they're huge, hugely important. And I know it's easier said than done to just like stress less and relax. So it is a thing that we kind of have to work through these days, definitely. I'm working on it too. Um, um, but yeah, it's hugely important. But I like that quote from her. Okay, so then this, the last sort of pillar um, I have here that I found to be crucially important in living well with autoimmune disease um, is assembling a care team. And um, basically, you know, like elite athletes get to have all these people that like work around them and make them function optimally and all these things. And I feel like we all should have that too. Um, <laughs> and sometimes you go to one doctor and it might, you know, it might not be enough. It might not be the whole picture. And they, you know, you have to kind of take what you need from each person. But I found this to be critically important for my own health and I help other people work with this as well. Um, so this is my care team, sort of. Um, it's okay, they know their pictures are up here, but that is my rheumatologist. Um, so I get you know blood work and medications and things like that from him. Um, I have worked with a dietitian who's really helped me with my um, gut issues and working on all that, which is can be a long process. So it's great to have someone really knowledgeable. Um, we have a therapist over there too, and you know working, uh, going through chronic autoimmune disease can be really stressful and can be really lonely at times too if nobody understands what you're going through. And so having a counselor or therapy or somewhere where you can just talk about that, because oftentimes in doctor's appointments you may not get that chance, um, is really beneficial as well. I have a, you know, a couple of good therapist friends in the group here. I could give some referrals um, if anyone needs one. And uh, physical therapist, so I don't, I don't personally see that, but I just put it in there and maybe like as an example of someone as part of your care team, um, that can be really crucial for a lot of people with rheumatoid problems too, to have a physical therapist. Um, that's my acupuncturist. Uh, it's not for everybody, but for me it's really helped with the relaxation response and has really helped me as something. So you could do acupuncture, you could do you know whatever. There's so many things out there, so you just gotta find your thing. Um, health coach, so that's me, um, what I do. Um, and I kind of work in a lot of different areas of this, but sort of work people to assemble care teams, go through diet, lifestyle, work on um, you know stress response, and it's really just a holistic approach is what I do, because I think that that's kind of what we're missing. So um, health coach can be a vital part of a care team as well. That's my mom there, she's up there because she's a patient advocate, so um, she doesn't mess around. Um, and so going through all of this, if you're not your own advocate, you need someone to be your advocate for you. And advocate isn't being like going in and being feisty and telling the doctor you know, what to do. It's like really not that. It's just working with, understanding that you're part of a, a, a partnership and you're part of the team, um, asking the right questions and doing research so you can have a meaningful conversation with the doctor because they would appreciate that, um, asking good questions. Um, but just, if you don't have one, um, getting some sort of advocate or someone that can help. And so maybe, Mom, you can <laughs> give out your uh, resources as well. Um, and then me in the middle. So you are part of your team, too. I just wrote a blog post about being your own advocate, so it's on my mind now. But um, being, yeah, it's crucial. It's probably the number one thing you can do for your health. Because um, a lot of times, it kind of the model of healthcare we have, it sort of feels like your health isn't really any of your business. Um, and it is 100% your business, and um, you should be really active and proactive in your care. And you know that's kind of what I found was the next level for me. I was kind of sick of, I mean, once I got the go ahead that I had a little bit of control, a little little bit of leeway. It probably like went too far with it, but you know there's, um, you know you can't just sit around and feel sorry for yourself or try and you know wait for someone to tell you what to do. I found that it's really. Um, really, really beneficial and has helped me the most to be my own advocate and to kind of educate myself. Um, but also knowing I have to rely on all these other people. I cannot do all this on my own. You have to have a whole a whole team um, to help you. So that's my team. Um, and I would encourage other people to get a sort of team as well. Um, okay, yeah, so then that's all. Then I'm just gonna end with, this is one of my favorite quotes from Andrea Nakayama. She's a functional nutritionist. And she says, it's time to reclaim our physiology and fully understand how our bodies are impacted by our personal histories and methods of self-care. It's time to connect the dots and recover a system of health care that honors the individual and the whole person who is seeking health and remedy. So I really like that as a, a sort of um, holistic approach and something we can kind of set our sights on. 
um, in terms of autoimmune disease and chronic disease <coughs> and just health and wellness and living well and everything like that. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs>
it's, it kind of depends the cause. Like if it's a lot of stress or something like that, then you would, um, you know, the protocol would be different. But I think with any sort of healing thing with the stomach, it's probably taken a long time to get there. So you have to expect to take a couple months or so to get back. Um, which is hard for people because we want like a magic fix and we want everything to be ready right away and I wanted that too and it's really frustrating and you're like, but um, but it's a process and it involves kind of like a little bit of lifestyle shift, not change, just a little shift. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just want to compliment you for being brave enough to do this. Oh, thank you. And um, so I've had lupus since I was 14, it took nine years to diagnose. And the two things, if you're new to this, is absolutely just standing up for yourself and knowing yourself. I keep a symptom journal. But if I didn't have my advocate that could go to my appointments with me, because sometimes if I get emotional or I forget, yeah. Yeah. you do have that thing. So yeah. those two things, just really standing up for yourself yeah. and getting that person that can be a part from your body to remember like you did have a nice sweat or whatever it is, that kind of thing, yeah. really good advice. So, yeah. And then society doesn't necessarily embrace that of us standing up for self and 75% of us are women. So, Go for it. So thank you for doing the talk, which is really yeah. that's the best advice that I would say to you. Plus, I'm glad that to have you um, sort of agree with, like, you know, as someone that's really experienced it, that's good to hear, for sure, because I agree, right? And we forget, you know, when we're, that's why I always say, like, bring someone with you to a doctor's appointment um, to write something down or things like that, and you're, you're lucky you've got a good advocate. So it's so important, yeah, to have that. Even just support, but like you said, you forget things, and you're... And then you, sometimes you get rushed. The visits are very short, and that's a lot of the problem, too. And you can leave being like, oh my god, I didn't ask the five million questions. So I always say write questions down before, too. So you can say, nope, I have a few more, actually. Um, <laughs> and do that. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, touching on that, I usually like type up like, a whole list of all my symptoms like weeks before or days before, so I like remember everything that I want to say. Yeah. And then I just hand it to them, and they're like, wow, you're so prepared. Yeah. <laughs> I know how to help you when you don't waste like 20 minutes of your time. Well, yeah. I'm just like getting your symptoms. So. And they are, res yeah, because that's what, you know, like there are practitioners who want to help us, you know, so they come into it wanting to help you. So if you can kind of set get yourself set up the best yeah, way, you exactly like help you said. Help you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're like, here, make it easy. So yeah, awesome. That's a really good, that's a really good point, too. So yeah, because you forget as the weeks go along too what happened, and so writing it down as you go, yeah, to track things. Yeah. Is there just a whole lot more autoimmune uh, problems that we have now, or are we just not aware of it? Yeah, you know that's, that's a good so question. I know, and I don't really know the answer because maybe it's like we're just becoming aware, you know, with other diseases and whatever. I I don't totally know the answer, but um, Someone else might be able to answer that better for me, but um, I think also a lot of the you know women's issues like adrenal fatigue and thyroid burnout and all of these things are kind of coming with a lot of stress issues and imbalance and stress hormones and things like that. And as we become sort of busier and busier and try to do more and more, um, I know that the you know like the naturopath they see is just overwhelmed with thyroid issues and things like that. And I, I know that stress and those things can be a factor. I don't know. Does anyone else? Have a better answer. The processed food. Yeah, the horrible the, food. The food. The yeah, fact that our yeah. food has gone gotten horrible in the past four decades is, I think, um, what has been in a lot of people's environmental trigger is yeah. that they're putting horrible things in, and that's how the body, because the body is like, what is this? And that's how it responds. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely a factor too. Um, the diet, do you? Yeah, um, when the United States first found it in 1776, uh, the average American ate about 14 pounds of sugar per person that per year. Now it's closer to 140 pounds per person per year. Yeah. The number one source of calories in the United States is now high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. Uh, gluten proteins went from 8 in your average wheat plant to 14 in the 1970s. So our environment and our lifestyles have changed dramatically without us doing it. Yeah. Yes. That's what I wanted. Thank you. Yeah. Totally. That's what I didn't have the story up here, but it's totally right. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think all of those factors too um, is contributing. And it's contributing to a lot of, you know, it's chronic issues we're seeing a lot more of. And what I find and kind of why I've gotten into doing what I'm doing now is um, that, you know, our healthcare system does a really awesome job at treating acute care. Like, of course, I'd want to go, you know, here um, if, or if you'd have possible if I had a heart attack or something in terms of management of chronic 
disease, a lot of times there's a lot of gaps between you know seeing your doctor and then how to implement these things in your everyday life. Um, and you know people are living longer, and just the burden of chronic disease is bigger, not just autoimmune disease, but it's a huge one too. Um, and so you know I think just the way we treat it as well, um, we sort of need to shift gears and shift things around and figure out how we can um, support people better who are living longer with chronic diseases too. Yeah. I was going to say, I think part of it too has to do with the stigma of autoimmune because you look at somebody and they don't look sick. Mm -hmm. And um, I know I have a dear friend that has lupus and she's dealt with that adversity for a very long time. And I think what society had done for so long was a, you're a hypochondriac because you have all these issues and it's all in your head. And I think that fortunately healthcare is shifting and this is being recognized because back in the day when you had this, this chronic pain and all these issues, it was just like, oh, you know, no, nah, whatever, you know, basically, and they just brush you off and all in your head. So I think that, that um, I think with that question is I think it's coming more to the forefront because people are recognizing it for what it is now, and that it is a real, it is a real thing, and it's not. Um, yeah, and like you said, invisible illness too. That's I didn't talk about that during this, but that's a huge thing with autoimmune disease too. It's like you look not to put Dr. Overman on the spot, but you wrote a book yep. called uh, "You Don't Look Sick," uh, and so it's I recommend that to everyone. But um, but it's kind of going, you know, talking about that um, issue too, and that makes it a really hard to deal with and get help with as well because you know if you break your leg there it is everybody sees it but there's a lot of different kind of invisible illnesses but autoimmune disease is definitely one of them that makes it um makes it hard to not it too so that's a good point for sure thank you yeah. do you have any favorite books or resources for learning more about nutrition nutrition yeah i have a ton um I'll, yeah, if you comment later and get your i'll get your email and can email you them i have like a whole stack um off the top of my head, um, there's a really great autoimmune one called the Autoimmune Wellness Handbook, um, which just came out. It's new. It's um, uh, these women who started autoimmune paleo certain diet, but it's so you don't have to. I mean, you don't need to necessarily have to follow that, but it's really great holistic guide for autoimmune. I mean, in terms of nutrition, let me think. I'll write them down and I'll I'll get it back to you. I can't like think of them right now. <laughs> Very well. Another layer um, of all of this that I've recently discovered is like with genetic testing that, you know, I've discovered I don't produce certain enzymes and, you know, to digest certain foods or to process certain vitamins and things like that, that all of a sudden I look at that and it's like, oh, I've been taking this for years and it's never really worked and I get a different form of it and all of a sudden it's night and day difference. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 That and like, you know, like with the gluten uh -huh. thing, it's like, well, I don't have celiac, but I don't produce a certain enzyme that breaks it down very well, so, yeah. duh. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, there's a lot of, um, and that's kind of in that re replace section of the, you know, protocol that people do, um, and is putting in those different enzymes, because a lot of people are deficient in those enzymes, and um, Sometimes we think we have too high <coughs> stomach acid, but we've been taking proton pump inhibitors to turn off the stomach acid, and then we're really screwed because we have no acid to digest any of the foods. So yeah, exactly like you said, those can be a huge factor too. Um, and you got genetic testing through like a Well, you, I did some initially through a naturopath uh -huh. um, that looked at just specific things. My husband did the same thing with certain cardiac things, but you can do like the 23andMe and then take the raw data and there's websites that will interpret it for you. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. So it's it's really cool and really fascinating. Yeah, and awesome. it's just since the Human Genome Project, so yeah. it hasn't been around that long. Oh, nice, okay, good to know. But it's really fascinating info. Oh, awesome, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've actually had like five people
that said, yeah. Are you aware of anyone who's really looking at hormones? I mean, you mentioned a lot of it's women. I see some real vulnerability points on a lot of times women in childbirth or seem to discover these things and it's menopause and, and you know, I think there's something going on there and they've looked at stress hormones a little bit. I'm not aware of anyone who really seems to be doing too much about it, you know, or even naturally yeah. kind of on the cortisol thing, but it's pretty. There's, I have one really great naturopath that's uh, in Bellevue that she does a lot with the horm hormones, sort of. Um, it's not really my area. I don't know tons about that. Um, there's, yeah, there's, I mean, I guess it would just be the naturopath. There's a woman that I, well, I just used one of her quotes, Andrea Nakayama. She's a functional nutritionist. She talks about, about a lot about thyroid health, women's health, and she kind of taps into the hormone part of it. Like, I've watched some webinar series from her. But in terms of just day-to-day -day practitioners, yeah, I don't, I guess it would just be the, the naturopath, but I'm not totally sure. Because, yeah, it's a huge, that's a huge, um, huge issue, too. Yeah. I don't have a great answer. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could say anything more about exercise. You mentioned that running yeah. is a trigger for you. Yeah. And I wonder, can you have like a, does your body have a stress response to certain types of exercise? Or what do you Yeah, do? that's a good, really good question. Um, I don't think I realized, I didn't realize it for a while, but it um, sometimes with running or the kind of pushing yourself uh, exercise, like sort of, I guess, type A exercise, whatever, for a lot of people with autoimmune conditions, it exacerbates things even if you don't have joint pain or something. Um, and I don't know the exact mechanism why, but it's just that it's kind of, um, I don't know if it's increasing inflammation or if it's doing something, but a lot of times it makes people's symptoms a lot worse. And so personally, I find that, I mean, I have to do, I mean, I do yoga and really chill exercises and things like that because running just is makes my symptoms a lot worse. And I found that for a lot of other people too. So you think, did you know about the exercise? Yeah. Do you want to tell us? Uh, pushing yourself while running will increase your overall systemic inflammation. Uh, yeah. But there is a lot of heart benefits to doing aerobic exercise. So I have some patients working on high intensity interval training, which you don't push yourself as long term to so keep the inflammation lower and still get some of the benefits of the really high rates. So it might be something to look into, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And then, or you, I find doing things like yoga where you have, you know, you're keeping your breath at a steady state, but you're still working. Um, <clears throat> or I guess, a lot, I don't know, whatever, different exercises where you're not, like you said, really extreme pushing yourself, I find her a lot, a lot better. So, <coughs> I guess you kind of have to see what works for you, but. Bar is really good. Consensus bar, yeah. So bar, yeah, that'd be good one too. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, yeah. Well, two things I know, but kind of going into issues, and it's all health coach, and maybe as my different resources. One of my concerns is that I can't afford a place that's quiet enough to sleep. And I've contacted the city council a lot and looking at if there's any advocacy groups you've talked to or the patients of like trying to find communities that there's um the Washington State Advocacy Association. I can write it down for you. I would say talk to them. They know way more than me. But they're a really cool organization. I'll yeah. I'll get you. I'll write it down for you. I have some um little recipes, anti-inflammatory recipes here, and a little meal planner template. It's blank, but it's like just to get into meal planning stuff and shopping list, because that's kind of the key if you're doing any of these diets. So if you guys want to grab one of these, in my card too. Um, and then my little email sign up list is going around. I won't send you tons of emails, something like once a month, so. <laughs> 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 <laughs>